Welcome, welcome everyone. We're so glad to be together again. This is Lucky Sweeney and my pal. Hello everybody, this is Mary Shea. We're glad to be back with you. And so we thought we'd do just a little bit of a review of where we've been and where we're going. Reviewing week one, we talked about the Sacred Heart Contract, a Sacred Heart Contract or a request to tell everyone to understand that composing a contract or making a request can lead to attracting and manifesting what you want in your life, spiritual growth, establishing a co-creative partnership, opening your heart more fully, and then we talked about the six-step process, including communicating and working with your co-creative partner. So that was week one. During week two, we defined what is co-creation and went on to talk about the co-creative partner, including who is your co-creative partner. We also discussed what your expectations were of your co-creative partner and what your relationship might be coming into the co-creative process. We described how to connect with the co-creative partner. We spoke about flow and the elements necessary for the process of co-creative manifestation. Then in Lesson 3, Lucky and I talked about communicating with your co-creative partner. All the different ways the communication may occur, the types of communications you might receive, and both Lucky and I shared some of our personal experiences. There was an explanation of what is indicative of a good communication and that you need to assess the quality of the communication. What is most likely not a communication from your co-creative partner. Once you have determined that it is a communication with your co-creative partner, you need to be able to interpret what is being said and what is being conveyed. Then we'll talk about the four necessary elements for manifestation. Desire, tempered by openness. Your sustained focused thought, which is your contract. Flow, which is manifestation weather and then the avenue of manifestation, which may involve action on your part. And lastly, we talked about what impending manifestation might feel like. It might be a very chaotic time in your life, a very stressful time in your life. The energy seems to rise as spirit is coming into form, and you need to hold steady during that time of formation. What we're going to do now is we're going to talk a little bit about troubleshooting the process for manifestation. And a lot of people will think if things are not moving along, it must be flow. And actually, flow is the last thing that you check. The slide that is up, the troubleshooting process for manifestation, this lists the order in which you look at the process of manifestation. And we're going to go through these five items and talk about the process. So the first one is communicate with your co-creative partner. That's where you start. The second one is look at desire and openness. The third one is the sustained and focused thought. Uh, the fourth one is the avenue of manifestation. And then flow is last. This is the order that you would investigate what is going on with the process of manifestation. And the thing is that you have a lot of control over those first four. So we'll talk about those individually. I just want to say this whole process, often there is some silence in the process, periods where things are in process and it's quiet. And part of the winning strategy in this is to hold on, is to hang in, you know, because sometimes it's just quiet as things are beginning to manifest for you, as things are getting lined up. So I just thought about that and how important that is. Too many people give up in the quiet times. You know, things just seem quiet, you know, like, oh, well, nothing's happening. But in truth, there's always something happening. 
I think that's so true. You need to think of it in terms of a gestation period. This process of manifestation isn't an alakazam process. It does take time for formation to occur. Sometimes you can actually feel the energy coming into formation, and you can see the pieces starting to fall into place. The first thing that you look at is what is going on with communication. You have to assess the strength and quality of your connection because this is going to tell you everything's cool, just wait. That's a possibility. So you have to look at you know the strength, the quality of your connection, and your communication with your co-creative partner and make sure that if it doesn't feel strong enough to you, if you don't have a sense of information, that maybe you ought to spend a little bit more time. The quality of your connection is very important. Then you need to evaluate the nature of communications, which we talked about before, you know, the characteristics of it. Are they loving? Are they supportive? Those type of things. Sometimes when people feel like things are not happening fast enough, it's because they're falling into predictions. They have expectations that things need to occur at a particular time, and sometimes they will feel like that's the prediction that's coming through to them that next week, Tuesday, everything's going to happen. Well, still, you know, timing is a relative thing, so it's better not to fall into prediction. And then also you need to be aware, do you have faith in your co-creative partner? Because you may be getting messages to take certain actions, and if you don't have faith in your co-creative partner, then nothing is going to move forward. So these are the problems, uh, overview of the problems with communication. And you do have control over this. If this is a new practice for you to be working with a co-creative partner, You need to give yourself plenty of space and time for that relationship to develop and to come into the rhythm and the languaging and the awareness of yourself and what you see and perceive. So if this is new, it doesn't have to be perfect right away. And you may be shifting through and sorting through how that communication is actually coming to you. You know, before you totally feel comfortable and like you're sure about what's going on. And that's really okay. It would be another reason not to give up because it's taking time. Because, as we've said many times before, this is a lifelong skill. You know, this is just one training ground for being able to be in communication with a co-creative partner in every aspect of your life. One of the things that I'm aware of in communication is sometimes there's a lack of communication. In other words, you're not getting a lot of feedback, and what do you do in that situation? I think this is a stage on your heart opening that sometimes you must proceed with what you have been taught. I mean, spiritual principles philosophy, belief, trust, putting one foot in front of the other, and proceeding without a lot of hand-holding and waiting patiently. Some people might call this the dark night of the soul, but not necessarily. It's a time when you are testing your strength in what you have learned, and you're able to proceed without constant feedback, constant signs, constant communication, you're just staying in the trust, staying in the moment, staying in the character, the principles that you've learned, and just being with that. The second step would be to look at your desire. We've talked about being open. And sometimes we can want something so much that we're clinging to it strongly. We have expectations about how it should occur, when it should occur, and we need to remain open. So that's one thing to consider. Some of the things I thought about, this too strong and clinging to expectations, a common one that people do in that is timing demands. In the timing demands, they're thinking that it's going to happen within a particular time period and they have a deadline. 
So there's a controlling uh, the when, there may be a control of the how that is going on or some type of situation demand that the person is making. Which is probably going to cause some kind of separation from source, you know, from your divine, that kind of strong egoic charge. Yes, because there's not a yielding at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other side of the coin is that desire is too weak. There's no investment because maybe your interest has changed or maybe it's not what you really want at this point. You Remember, you can rewrite your contract at any time. And so you're just not invested in this particular desire anymore. I think we know that sometimes your intention changes, right, as you get deeper and deeper into it. Sometimes I get into that alignment and I realize, oh, this isn't exactly it. It's really just a little hair over here. I thought I wanted a blue car. No, I really want a red car. I mean, that's, you know, trivializing, but that kind of idea. Desire is starting to shift, and there is a renegotiation that may be happening that is part of what is going on here. And it's almost like it's a failure to renegotiate rather than renegotiation, because renegotiation is allowed. And I think that's where I would put in some of the looking at our own growth and our own development of desire being able to be where it is right now and in acceptance of that and see where that moves us to in time versus the strong attachment to what you thought it was yesterday and the idea stuck in the past. The third thing is that you have conflicting desires. They can be mutually exclusive. For example, maybe you want to be a doctor and a lawyer. Those particular paths both involve a tremendous amount of work, and it's very hard to do both. So they're somewhat mutually exclusive, and you have to look and see if there are conflicting desires. It can also be valuable at this point, I think, to really go up a level with your desire and examine once again, not just what do you want, what is the experience you're wanting to have in this? And that can be a way of activating the energy at a more universal level. So that say, for instance, I want a new car. The experience I'm looking for might be safety, security, or comfort, or something like that, that may lift you out of the attachment and put you in the place where your essential nature is looking for something uh, more universal. And that helps me when I get stuck about a specific thing to then go, oh, that's the experience I want to have, and less attached to how it might actually look. Then there's the overly complex contract the ones that are covering so many bases, it's difficult to focus. And with something like this, you may want to pare down. If you have a very complex contract, you're going to have to prioritize. You're going to have to be an organizer to a certain extent. It seems to me that it's easier if you can be direct and clear about the items. If you have too much there, your focus is going to be scattered. doubts or fears, a fear of success, a fear of failure. There can be a number of emotions that come up. This is part of the cleansing process. There's growth going on when you create this contract, and it's going to push you into new areas. So there is a tendency towards anxiety in the process of growing to meet what it is that you want to have in your life. And you have to be aware of when that conflict rears its head and you are faced with doubt or hesitation. 
there is a possibility of sabotaging your desire. And you have to make your way through your own emotional growth into this new spiritual dimension. To that point, I would say that it's a good time to have some strategies or some things that you would do when we feel that our desire to have something puts us out on the limb a little bit. And we can anticipate that there are going to be moments where we have doubts, fears, anxiety, that kind of thing. I put techniques that lower that immediate sense of discomfort or fear or anxiety that um, can allow you to then reconnect into your vision, into what it is that you really want, and to be able to pull out what maybe is causing the anxiety, which might be some piece of information you need, just even taking a deep breath. For me, it's a way of dancing with this process process isn't necessarily going to be smooth. How am I dancing with it? How am I riding the waves that come along that will help me to sustain the focus, which we're going to talk about in a minute, of the longer of a process that can sometimes go on for a bit. We have some time to um, wait to see the fulfillment. And so these are some of the problems that can occur with desire. This is such an interesting aspect for me. When I first started with making contracts and intentions, I had an idea of what I wanted. And what I found over time was that often that was the appearance of what I wanted at some level, but not really what I wanted. And so as Mary was saying about rewriting your contract, what I found for myself is that it's like the peeling the onion thing, you know. So I thought I wanted a relationship of some kind, you know, whether it was a friend or a business partner or a personal partnership. Really what I was looking for was a level of creative experience with someone. It wasn't really the relationship I was looking for, but I was looking for a creative experience, which I thought was a relationship. As I worked with this process, I had to go deeper within myself about what was it that I really wanted, and it, my deepest desires start revealing themselves to me through this process. But that's part of that give and take, that walking with the co-creative partner, because at some conscious level, we may think it looks one way, and then as we move along and we get involved in it. So using this as a dynamic process, using your contract as a dynamic self-discovery, and when, when you're kind of reading at it, maybe you've been working with this contract for a month or two months or three months, and somehow you're not really sure um, where you are with it, it's also possible to just peel it away, you know, what else is being called for here? Or what feeling am I having about this? Very valuable process for me. You bring up the point. Asking is a learning process. Desire is a learning process. We learn from it and we move on. We change with it. The next thing to look at is your sustained, focused thought. What can happen at this particular level is that you get very rigid. You've got a plan how things are supposed to happen. You narrow your focus. I think where we get hung up on rigidity is seeing ourselves at the control panel. We see ourselves as the master rather than working in a cooperative manner with our co-creative partner and we develop this rigidity on how things should proceed and what our role is in that process. The focus on end desires is certainly important. You want to be able to let that get fluid because we do not know how it's going to show up. And so being too focused on it's going to look exactly like this and it's going to do that, I think that's one of the big pitfalls we all fall into. And if we can open up at this point, not letting go in any way of our desire, but really sustaining our focus thought in a way of this is what I want again, 
that then allows me to let go a little bit of the sense of needing to control every moment, every thought. I think the inability to focus sometimes is related to the inability to make an adjustment, not just a renegotiation of your contract, but to adjust to the changing circumstances around the manifestation of what it is that you want in your life. This is a very dynamic, vital process. It's in movement. You want the energy in movement. And if you don't stay current with the process, if you lose that ability to focus and instead are just going along, wandering, then it doesn't move because it doesn't have the dynamic interaction that is needed in order to move your desire forward. It's kind of like if you're taking pictures with a camera. You're taking a broad landscape picture, but as you move closer, you have to adjust the focus. You're constantly adjusting the focus. You're learning from this interaction. And so if you're narrow and rigid, then you're not moving, you're not redefining, you're not refocusing. There can be both sides of the problem, where you're too focused or you're not focusing and adjusting as you go along. The third thing is you can be scattered or distracted. This can have something to do with life, but it also can be just your process that you're not sustained that you get distracted by something else. And maybe what that something else is conflicts with what your focus sustained thought was. Always a good idea for me to have little pictures of things if I'm working on something or I have an affirmation that I have on a mirror in the bathroom in a place in my bedroom that just allows me to connect my focus. That can be one of the little helpful things to keep the focus on what it is that you want as you go through the day-to-day life handling what we have to do. Excessive thinking, for me, is wanting to know everything in advance. This is a listening process. You have a co-creative partner and there's give and take. There's back and forth. If you're doing all the analyzing, excessive thinking, then there's not a whole lot of listening space, and that's important. And the fifth thing is that you need some logical explanation. There is no logical explanation. This is a process where things happen that appear to be miraculous or even magical. And there is no logical explanation to that. So don't get hung up on that. We cling to causality. There must be a scientific explanation. There isn't a scientific explanation for what can go on. You have to be willing to enter the unknown, one foot in front of the other, staying with this constant communication and feedback and this dynamic process and allow for miracles. You don't have to understand how it happened, why it happened, when it happens, any of that. You just need to stay in the movement. Then there are the problems with the avenue of manifestation. And this is all stuff that you control. Procrastination is a big one. People delay, delay, delay. They don't take action and they miss moments of flow because they're not prepared. In other words, flow can come along, but maybe there were some prerequisites that you were aware that you needed to take care of and now you have procrastinated and you're behind the momentum. I think allowing ourselves to see the avenue of manifestation can be a process of allowing ourselves to be open to signals and signs that maybe are more subtle, that are giving us clues, either clues to hang in there and uh, keep on going, or clues to what the next step might be we need to take to complete the manifestation that we're working on. 
interesting that you use the word steps because I think this is one of the things that is associated with disorganization. Because you don't have your finger on the pulse, so to speak, you're not aware of the steps you need to take and possibly when you need to take them, but also in what order. There needs to be some sense of organization. This is where the brain is serving the process. The brain is the connection and understanding what is coming in from your co-creative partner and then organizing the steps. So you may have a step as, such as there's something that you need to do. And in order to do that, you need possibly a piece of equipment. You need a piece of factual information or knowledge. And so you gather the elements necessary for that step, and you take that step at the appropriate time and in the appropriate order, and then move on to the next step. And sometimes in terms of the step, it can be a leap of faith. You aren't sure exactly why this step is in front of you. Maybe something you need to do or maybe something that you see you need to do that you didn't necessarily know that was the next step. And so this could be part of that being in the flow and the faith and taking that step even though you're not sure exactly where it's going. But it feels right someplace within you. Here's another place where we are co-creating with a greater force that we don't totally understand in a linear way and that we surrender to our own sense sense of, okay, I'm not exactly sure why I'm taking this next step, but I'm taking it. So the next step can be something that's really clear, something that you, you, you've been putting off or a task you need to do, and sometimes it might be a little bit of a leap of faith. I think impatience and overcompensation, this is where someone gets frustrated with the whole process and figures this isn't happening, they're disheartened, they lose faith, it's not happening on their timetable in the manner that they thought, and this is where they resume control. At that point, they've fallen out of the process. Sometimes there are preconditions and this can be legitimate. In other words, if you want to be a doctor in a third world country and you're only in college, you have to go through med school. So there are preconditions. You've got a long-range plan, a long-range contract. You have to get those skills. Those skills are essential, and there may even be certification that you need. But there's also the possibility where you build in preconditions. In other words, I'm not confident, so therefore I need a certificate or a degree. Preconditions can be something that is required, but it also can be something that you put in place that distanced you from your goal. Chaotic life, I think this happens to a lot of us at various times, but certainly early in the process there may be some cleansing going on as that is taking place or before that takes place. We may feel like we're overwhelmed by drama in our life or chaos in our life. That chaos and drama can be self-made or it can be made by outside influences and we don't know how to disengage so that we can focus on our contract, focus on what is important and clear that kind of clutter to the side. You don't necessarily have to eliminate everything, but you have to clear your path so that you can see how it is that you are proceeding without all this interruption or chaos that can be overwhelming you emotionally. Yeah, point is so great. One of my main techniques in regards to this is don't engage. There will always be people in your life that are chaotic, that have their drama, that have their pain bodies, that will be creating drama around you. But you don't have to buy into it. What I mean by that is you maintain your center. Sometimes I think of it as like water running downhill. As water is running downhill, if there's a rock, the water goes around the rock and continues on its path downhill. You can also think of it as wind. 
that blows over you. You can be concerned, you can be sympathetic, you can be empathetic, you can be compassionate, but you don't lose your center. There's always going to be chaos somewhere around you, drama somewhere around you, but you're able to maintain your center and not get blown off course. The problem with complexity as it relates to the avenue of manifestation is that complexity scatters your energy. You may be taking multiple actions at the same time. This is like juggling balls in that there are a number of balls that you're trying to keep in the air. At some point, it becomes too difficult to keep up. You lose your momentum and rhythm. Needing to renegotiate, this is part of that refining. This may take you a little longer, but at the same time, you're getting closer and closer to what you really want. In renegotiation, you ask for something. Say you want to go and buy a used car, and you decide you want a particular car. Maybe you want a hybrid car. You go looking, and you find a hybrid car in your price range, but it's all beat up and dented. Then what you do when you renegotiate, you say, thank you to your co-creative partner, but what I really want is a car that has a good body in my price range. So maybe you go and a friend says to you, oh, I know of a car down the street, and you go and look at the car down the street. And it's a hybrid, and it has a good body, but it has very high mileage. And so maybe you say, okay, this is great. We're moving in the right direction, but what I really want is a hybrid car with a good body and low mileage. And so you're renegotiating, and that's okay. That's like rewriting your contract. It takes a little longer, but you get closer and closer to what you want. Lack of financial support. Certainly, there have been times that I've leapt from the cliff. But I'm also a practical, realistic person when it comes to financial support. Whatever I am endeavoring to do, I know I will be supported in the process. But at the same time, I also know that I am accountable. There is always a consideration in regards to what I am attempting to do around financial support. Do I have financial support at this present time? Do I have savings? Do I have resources, residual income? But also, I can expect some financial support coming from my co-creative partner. But how much do I want to lean on my co-creative partner? How much do I want to expect? I think that this is a consideration. And people can get afraid of the situation this can change your emotions around this process. So I think it's important to be aware of financial and accountability issues when you're starting out and when you're going into this because any anxiety that you have around it can pull you away and derail the process. Yeah, excellent point. You can't expect to be growing spiritually when you're not ethical or you lack integrity. I have said time and time again, you cannot receive when you're cheating another person. Pay your bills. You have to be honest, forthright. Morality is part of this process. Having integrity is part of this process. Your co-creative partner expects you to rise to the situation. Your co-creative partner cannot go slumming with you. So you have to raise your energy, which means you have to have integrity. The last one here is feeling like you never got started. What do you do when nothing's happening? First of all, determine whether the ball's in your court or it's in God's court or your co-creative partner's court. If the ball is in your court, then what you need to do is test the waters. What action can you take 
and then once you've taken that action, see what the reaction is. It starts to be a feedback mechanism, not just between you and your co-creative partner, but it's a feedback mechanism in regards to what works in reality in your life. You send a ball out, do a pitch, you test the water, and you see what comes back. It may be that there's a temporary stoppage that is going on. There may be a period of inactivity. You may find that there's a distraction. But being aware of what is happening and what is not happening is part of staying in the momentum, even when nothing is happening. Mary, I would ask you a question. How do we know whether the ball's in our court or in the court of our co-creative partner? Well, one way that you would know is that whatever step needs to be taken is absolutely not under your control. There's no way that you could have control over that step. Then it's definitely in God's corner. So it might be that you're waiting for a door to open, and it's not opening. You're waiting for a signal before you begin the process. Maybe you've been told to wait until the signal is given because then your timing will be correct. In those particular cases, the ball would be in God's court. If you have this sense of urgency and you know what step needs to be taken, but when you take it, you don't get the reaction that you need, it might be a timing issue. And so periodically, you would test the water. You would take that step because it's well-defined as long as it's not working, though, there may be a timing issue, there may be a flow issue, there may be um, a coordination issue with your co-creative partner. So it's okay to test the waters, but do that while keeping the faith and being patient and working with the process. Great. Those are all really good points. And each of them has a lot of dimension to them. And I'm sure that nobody has every one of them. Each of us have two or three or maybe four that had pop up. And, of course, that's one of the values of doing this kind of desire work because love brings up anything unlike itself for the purpose of healing, that when we really want our heart's desire, anything that's in the way of us really having that is coming up so that we'll get it, so that we'll understand, oh, my gosh, I need to clear that stuff out of the way in order to really get what I want. So even the tough part, when you find yourself really procrastinating on this, just jump in and find out why. You know, what's the real reason you're procrastinating? Because this is one of the gifts of this process for you to come to a better understanding of what's keeping you back in any aspect of your life. So I think these are really good, although I don't really like seeing them. <laughs> it's not my favorite part of the process. It certainly is a real one. There are times you do need to look at yourself. The co-creative partner is saying, okay, you need to do this, and you just don't want to do this. I can remember sitting on my mat for three weeks saying, I won't do it, I won't do it, I won't do it. And then the co-creative partner said, stay stuck then. And that was scarier. Mm -hmm. Lastly, problems with flow. First, moving against the flow. And this is when things are not happening there's a lot of discouragement, setbacks. You feel like you're just running up against a wall. You want to be floating downstream, not trying desperately to paddle upstream. I have said before that I only bang my head against the wall three times. And then I've got to step back, have a conversation with my co-creative partner, because I may be going in the wrong direction. I may be going at the wrong time. I may be taking the wrong action. I do not want to fight the system. What we're trying to do here is to remain in the dynamic, remain in the system. When there are these stoppages, like three in a row where things are not working, it's time to step back and check in.
if you're not getting any response, it seems like you're not getting any assistance, there's no flow at all, this is a time to check in with your co-creative partner. Maybe you're just being told to wait. Maybe things are in formation. Maybe it's that silent time that Lucky was talking about. I think one of the things that we learn for ourselves and about ourselves in the flow process is what does that feel like? How do I know I'm there? What are the feelings that I have? I have a few indicators, kind of symbols that tend to show up in my life when I'm really in the flow. Even when I'm not feeling great, for instance, I have some numbers, 7-Eleven happens to be a good number for me. And oftentimes when I'm in a process like this, and either I'm not sure or feeling uncomfortable, I'll be sitting in my, in my car and a truck will go by and the back of the truck has a 7-Eleven or there's something on a billboard. I don't want to discount that those messages at all. They're really valuable. I think you bring up a very good point that even when you're becalmed, you can get encouragement. Maybe it's not the action that you want or the result that you want right at that point, but it's like a little flag waving saying, I'm with you, don't lose heart. And I think that's an important point. Slow moving and stagnant flow. Sometimes this comes from life complications where the situation can be overwhelming life sludge that is just slowing things down. Or this may be a complex contract, or you have a limited input contract on your part. That means you're expecting God to do everything. So things seem very, very slow. Delays, interference, and incorrect timing. It can be associated with procrastination, but there also can be true delays. There can be something that you want to do, and it's just not the right time yet. And you can tell that because of life experiences. Every time you try to move in a certain direction, there is something that interrupts that. And your co-creative partner is saying there's a delay for one reason or another. On the other hand, the flow can be so quick that you're not prepared. In that case, you can either catch up or you can also reschedule. That's the renegotiation. This was a really great opportunity. I would have loved to take part in it, but it's just really bad timing for me because of this, this, and this. Can we reschedule? And I would really like to do this. So those are issues around flow. The other four elements you have control over. This element, you have to be aware of what the manifestation weather is and be in sync with it. In regards to health contracts, this has normally been a very informal contract, but I'm aware when I'm dealing with a health issue that I will connect with my co-creative partner, I will discuss the medical issue with my co-creative partner. You can connect with your co-creative partner. You can discuss things in regards to different procedures. When I'm going into the doctor's office or I'm going into a procedure, I will ask my co-creative partner to help my professional, my surgeon, my doctor to make the best decisions to help me make the best decisions in regards to my health. Also, your co-creative partner can guide you towards healthier habits and diets. So I'm looking for support from my co-creative partner. And I also want to say in regards to health that there's no blame here. We all have genetic weaknesses. We have environmental stresses. And we age. And so there will be health issues that come up. And I don't want anyone to feel guilty if they're sick or if they're dealing with a repeat problem. Everyone has weaknesses that appear at different times. But I would encourage you to take those issues to your co-creative partner and be in that dynamic flow. 
in addition to traditional methods. In regards to business contracts, there's two different kinds. There's the sole proprietor contract that, in my case, is not formalized. I have never written up a business contract, but I definitely work with my co-creative partner. I discuss marketing ideas because even though you can be very creative with your co-creative partner, once you have created something, how do you market it? I discuss that also with my co-creative partner, discuss marketing ideas, resources, changes that I need to make in regards to my business, in regards to equipment, upgrades, resources, earnings. All of that, I think, can be discussed with your co-creative partner, and that's just between you and your co-creative partner. There's also, you can have a business agenda. In other words, it's like a business plan that you create with your business partner or company. You create some type of business goals. But still, you can work through that with your co-creative partner and stay on task because of that particular association. I think that's good to look at about those particular types of contracts and also I think how you work with your co-creative partner in terms of business is always a fascinating thing where it leads you in terms of different aspects. I mean, I know for me it's led me to extremely high levels of intuition in my own coaching and astrology work and learning to trust what I was feeling sometimes let go into that in terms of business because of that sense of, okay, business, this is business, this is money, this is something different, my spiritual life or my personal growth or something like that. But it isn't always the easiest place for me to move in in terms of using that co-creative partner. But then when I could, I began to sense everything worked easier in business you know, and in any kind of transactions around that or just uh, with coworkers, employers, all that kind of stuff. Just got to be a little easier and flow better. And not that I was told every minute in my work what to do, but that sense of that I am always part of something larger than just this. That allows me to then move into whatever it is that I'm doing in a more relaxed and centered place. I think that's a good point. I know for me, because I write and create, but then also do daily work too, that I'm aware that there's a fluctuation. That the times when I'm writing, the business has to sustain me while I'm writing. The financial end, I can remember the number of times I would open my checkbook and look up at the sky and say, I'm willing to do the work, but somebody's got to pay these bills. And I would expect the co-creative partner to bring in the work to pay the bills. Of course, I would do the work. But there were times when there was money in the checkbook that it was a time to create. There was a time to write or to do other things. Maybe it's a family thing that I needed to do. There was a flow. It's almost like switching tracks going from one foot to the other, where there were times when I wore one hat, the hat that was earning money, and then there was the hat that was creating. But there's also the hat that is the family or downtime. There's something about the process, even without doing a business contract, still working with your co-creative partner creates that flow and makes it easier, um, the whole process easier. I hope the information we have presented is life-changing for you and makes your life easier. I thank you all for being here with us, and I also thank my co-host, Lucky Sweeney. Loved your comments, Lucky. It's just been a lot of fun, and I've really enjoyed the process, and thank you very much for participating. I have certainly enjoyed it. Thank you. The information in this course is based on the book Heart Journey, written by Mary Shea under the spiritual pen name Mary Juno. The book is divided into three parts. 
Part 1, the initiation, is about writing your Sacred Heart contract. Part 2, the co-creative partnership and manifestation process, gives you communication techniques and also troubleshooting tips for the manifestation process. Part 3, Spiritual Development and Heart Openings, lists 12 co-creative thought transformations that will increase your ability to attract and 8 stages of heart openness. The more your heart is open, the greater your ability to receive abundance. The book is available at Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and your local bookstore. Also available in digital format everywhere for the iPad, tablet, iPhone, Android phone, Kindle, Nook, and computer. There are free apps available for all formats. In regards to coaching, let me just say, Lucky was my desire coach. There was a time that Lucky told me I could desire a tiara and it would be a spiritual experience. And I literally pushed my chair away from the desk, back into the wall, and curled into a fetal position. I've come a long way since then, Lucky. Lucky is a wonderful desire coach. If you don't know what you want, she's certainly excellent at this, and she's been at it for 25 years. So she's a, a good person to connect with.